Hi guys, welcome back. I want to talk a little bit about our own sun. This is material primarily from chapter 5. First of all, the sun is obviously, by a large measure, our nearest star. It's the easiest star to observe because of its proximity, and it's also very important from an environmental and ecological point of view because it's obviously essential to the sustenance of life on the planet Earth. So it's important for a number of reasons. It's also an example of a reasonably typical star. So by studying our own sun, we'll get a pretty good idea of how many of the stars in our universe behave. So let's start by looking at its basic properties. Then we'll dig into its structure a little bit and see how it's put together internally. We're going to discuss its composition and the light that comes from the sun so that we can understand what that's telling us. And we're going to end up talking about the uh, notion of solar activity and some of the cyc cyclical patterns we see in the sun's behavior. So, first of all, this is a image of our sun with, you can see, sunspots and so on. It has a a size that's about a hundred times, a little over a hundred times the size of the Earth. On the other hand, its volume is about 1.3 million times the Earth's volume. Now, how can that be, you say? How can you have 109 times the radius of the Earth and 1.3 million times the volume? Well, the answer is that volume goes like size cubed. So if I have a box that's, for example, one meter on a side, that would be one cubic meter. If I have another box that's two meters on a side, the volume of that box is going to be eight times the volume of the original box because it's twice as wide, twice as tall, and twice as deep. So it's going to be two times two times two meters, which will be eight cubic meters. And the sun gets the same benefit. It's a hundred times the radius and does over a million times the volume. So that makes sense. The mass of the sun, on the other hand, is not a million times the mass of the earth. It's only 300,000 times the earth mass. And that means its, its density, the mass per unit volume, works out to be a quarter of that of the Earth. That's the average density of the entire Sun. But the density of the core, according to our computer models, is about 12 times the average density of the Earth, which means that the density in the Sun varies wildly from the core out to the surface, from 12 times the density of the Earth at the core to many times less dense than the density of the Earth at the surface. The surface gravitational field strength is about 28 times the Earth's surface gravitational field strength, which also means the escape velocity of the Sun is much higher than the escape velocity of the Earth. This means that some of the gases which on the Earth escape out into space, like hydrogen and helium gas, on the Sun they remain trapped. In fact, we'll learn later that the composition of the Sun is primarily hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and not much else. So. We'll see how that works. Of course, the fact that the escape velocity is so high is an important part of that uh, Let's look now at the internal structure of the Sun. So the Sun has a, internally a nuclear reaction that's producing tremendous amounts of energy. In fact, it's this nuclear reaction that's preventing the Sun from collapsing under its own, as we saw, extremely a strong gravitational pull. So also this nuclear reaction produces energy that migrates all the way to the surface of the Sun, produces the hot sort of 5800 Kelvin surface that then produces the light that we see that's so important to life on Earth. The solar constant, 1360 watts per square meter, is a measure of the energy reaching the Earth's surface. So at the distance of the Earth, which is a one astronomical unit or 150 million kilometers from the Sun, even at that distance, the output power of the Sun is so fantastic that it produces uh, one point, almost 1.4 kilowatts of power per square meter at the Earth's surface. This is something like 20-some 60-watt light bulbs per square meter. So that's a tremendous output. The Sun is actually made up of a series of strata, or layers, 
The most interior layer is, of course, the core. This is where the nuclear reaction is ongoing. We're going to learn more about how this nuclear reaction works later when we study stars in detail. The next layer is called the radiative zone, and this is a layer in which the density and the temperature are dropping very rapidly as you go from the core outward to the surface. But the, uh, the density is so high and conditions are such that the major component, the, the major contribution to energy transport is radiation itself, electromagnetic radiation or photons. When you get far enough away from the core, the temperature drops enough and the density drops enough that another process can occur and actually sort of takes over for energy transport and that's called convection. Convection is a process whereby hot interior gas uh, expands and uh, actually physically moves outward. As it cools, it then becomes more dense and then it drops back in. And so it's sort of a, a circulation pattern that happens and it produces a, an appearance which you can see in the little inset there called a granule. Those granules, uh, let's see if I can point them out here, those granules are <clears throat> um, visible on the sun's surface uh, using a telescope and they produce uh, that sort of characteristic sort of modeled pattern that you see. So that's the radiative zone and the convection zone. Then Outside the convection zone is a very thin layer called the photosphere. The photosphere is uh, <clears throat> where most of the actual photons arise that we see at the Earth. Outside the photosphere is a very, very tenuous layer called the chromosphere, which you can only actually see during a total eclipse of the sun. And beyond that is something called the corona, which is an extremely tenuous uh, atmosphere, which uh, extends well beyond the photosphere out into space and is actually the beginning of the solar wind. So that's the, those are the names of the layers. As we encounter them in later parts of the course, I'll remind you about those guys. No need to really memorize these names, although it's good to be familiar with what they mean. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So here is a picture of the spectrum of light that the sun emits. And I want you to notice the similarity with the black body spectrum that we studied last time. The yellow is the actual spectrum produced by the sun, and you can see that it matches almost exactly the ideal black body spectrum of an object at 5777 Kelvin, uh, which produces an output energy for the total area of the sun of 1367 watts per square meter, which is the actual measured solar constant. So the black body spectrum does a really good job of explaining, I would say, over 90% of the sun spectrum. The actual deviations from black body spectrum have to do with the fact that it's not a perfect black body, but it's actually an object made of atoms that um, that have different emissivity at different temperature or different wavelengths, and so that sort of affects the degree to which the spectrum matches the ideal black body. It's not an ideal black body, but it's actually quite close. The other thing I want to point out is something about the behavior of atoms themselves. So what we have here is a schematic diagram showing the physical shape of the energy levels of hydrogen, helium, and boron. Now, what are energy levels? It turns out that electrons orbiting nuclei, which we also know as atoms, cannot take on just any kind of energy. They can only have certain discrete specific energy levels. And in hydrogen, those uh, the lowest energy level, there's only one electron in hydrogen, so the lowest energy level is n equals 1, then the next is n equals 2, and n equals 3. And you can see that the n equal 3 energy level of hydrogen actually is outside the radius of the n equal 4 energy level in helium. So the helium energy levels are more tightly bound than the hydrogen energy levels. And the reason is helium has two protons in the nucleus, and those protons exert a stronger interaction with the electrons of helium than they do the electrons, the one proton in hydrogen. And boron, even more so. The energy levels of boron actually fit inside. N equals 6 of boron fits inside the N equals 4 of helium. So the, the two lessons I want you to learn from that a schematic description is that 
more massive atoms, even though they have more protons and more electrons, are not necessarily physically, excuse me, physically larger. The details of an atom's shape and size are a combination of the number of electrons, but also how tightly bound they are. <clears throat> the other thing I want to point out is that if a photon passes by a hydrogen atom, say, and let's imagine the hydrogen atom, remember, is one electron and one proton. Let's say the electron happens to be in the ground state, the n equals 1 state at the moment, and a photon comes by. If that photon energy exactly matches the energy difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2, then that electron can jump from the n equals 1 state to the n equals 2 state. But if the energy doesn't match exactly, then the electron is unable to jump. And so what that means is if you've got a light of many different wavelengths passing by, the only, out of that light distribution of many different wavelengths, the only wavelengths that can actually engage with the atom are the wavelengths that happen to match the energy difference between two adjacent states, one of which is occupied and one of which is not. <clears throat> so if you have an electron in the ground state and you get an, a photon with just the right energy to go to n equals 2, then it can be absorbed. Or if you have a one that has the energy needed to go to n equals 3, then that guy can be absorbed. But if the energy doesn't match up, then uh, you will not get an absorption. So there's a cartoon in the book that I want to point out <clears throat> that shows um, a photon coming by an atom where the wavelength doesn't have the right property, doesn't the wavelength and the energy don't match, <clears throat> the energy difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2, so it just goes on by. In the next frame, you see a photon coming in that does happen to match the energy difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2, and boom, the electron jumps out to n equals 2, but after a while, it re-emits a photon of the same energy, and the electron goes back to the ground state. So the two lessons there are, one, not any energy photon can be absorbed. And if it is absorbed, it's the same energy that's going to end up being emitted. So, uh, in fact, that brings us to the three different type of spectra that we're likely to see in this class. On the left-hand side picture, I want you to see at the top, you're looking at direct sunlight. The, imagine the light bulb is sort of like a star you're going to see direct light coming from the hot surface. That produces a continuous spectrum with no breaks. Okay? If you put a cold gas between the light source and the spectrometer, some of the photons that happen to have exactly the right energy to, per, to uh, excite the transition between two specific energy levels, those guys are going to be absorbed and re-emitted. And you'll see that the spectrum now is the continuous spectrum from the first spectrum, but it's missing certain discrete energy levels. And those energy, those energies, those photon energies, happen to correspond to energy differences between definite levels of the atoms in the cold gas surrounding the light source. On the other hand, if you point your spectrometer to the cold gas adjacent to the light source, so that you're not looking directly at the light source, but only at the region of space surrounding the light source, you won't see the continuous spectrum from the light source, since you're not pointing at that guy, but what you will see are the photons that are re-emitted from the atoms after they've been excited by the light from the light source. And that will produce what's called an emission spectrum. The second picture on the right here has to do with the different series of spectra from hydrogen. So if you look at electron de-excitations, electrons falling down from upper-level states and landing in n equals 1, it turns out that the energy difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2 is 10 electron volts. Now remember that the energy of a photon is the Planck's constant times its frequency, which turns out to be the same as Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by its wavelength. So if you tell me the energy of a photon, I can tell you the wavelength of light that it produces by taking hc divided by lambda. That gives me the energy. So uh, it turns out the energy difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2 is 10 eV. So that means all the, light, all the light produced by any transition that lands in n equals 1 is going to be at least 10 
and probably more than 10 electron volts, and that produces wavelengths that are all way in the ultraviolet, all less than 150 nanometers. Remember, the visible spectrum only goes down to about 400 nanometers. On the other hand, if you have electrons that land in N equals 2, these guys all have wavelengths which are uh, less than 656 nanometers. That one is in a red line in the visible. 486 is sort of in the greenish part, the green-bluish part. And then 434 is pretty deeply in the uh, blue. 410 is on the borderline, probably in the ultraviolet. And then all these shorter wavelengths are in the ultraviolet. Those are called the Balmer series, the ones that start at n greater than 2 and end in n equals 2. The Lyman series, the ones we talked about earlier that end in n equals 1, are all in the UV. And the Poshin series are the ones that end in n equals 3. And those guys, as you can see, are all in the infrared. So the only visible part of the hydrogen spectrum is the part of the spectrum where the electrons start in a state n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, and land in n equals 2. And this Balmer series produces a lot of beautiful pictures like this one. Here is a hydrogen cloud in space being excited by uh, forming or very energetic stars. And you can see exactly the emission spectrum I'm talking about. If I had you guys in the face-to-face -face classroom, I'd be bringing out a spectral tube and firing it up in the classroom and handing out spectrometers and asking you guys to look at it and observe it and so on. Uh, in an online environment, that's harder to do. But I do want to point out that anytime you see an emission cloud like this, what you're looking at is those three wavelengths in hydrogen that are visible to the human eye, and they produce some beautiful, beautiful pictures. From the spectrum of light that comes from the sun, not only can you see the hydrogen spectrum, you can also see the spectrum of helium, carbon, nitrogen, and all these other guys. But I want to have you take a moment to look at the fraction of the mass of the sun that's made up of these different elements. <clears throat> Hydrogen is something like 70%. Helium is most of the balance, right? And then the remainder is just sort of peanuts, carbon, nitrogen, and so on. These guys are all down in a fraction of a percent. So um, mostly the sun is made of hydrogen, some helium, and very little of much of anything else. Now, if you actually look closely at the surface of the sun, one of the first things you'll notice is sun spots. And also, this picture makes the granules a lot easier to see. The granules are part of the convection zone that lies just beneath the photosphere. And you'll also see these spots. Now, what the heck are these spots? It turns out the theory that holds the most water at this time is that the sun spots arise when a magnetic field, a bundle of magnetic field lines, pierces the sun's surface. It turns out when it does that, it causes the motion in that uh, intersection between the magnetic field line bundle and the Earth's surface to cool down relative to the surface surrounding that bundle. And the drop in temperature, which works out to be, um, it goes from like 5,800 Kelvin to 4,800 Kelvin, almost 1,000 Kelvin. That um, is something like a 16 or 18 percent drop in temperature remembering that the Stefan Boltzmann law says that the emissivity or the amount of energy being produced goes like temperature to the fourth power. When you reduce the temperature by uh, 15 or 20 percent and you take that to the fourth power, it becomes a tremendous effect on the uh, emitted energy and these things appear in photographs and so on to be pretty much black spots. Now they're not really black, they're still producing energy, but just relative to the surrounding surface of the Sun, they're not producing nearly as much. The other thing I want to point out is that um, the magnetic field affects the spectrum of light emitted by the part of the Sun within the interior of a sunspot. And there's an effect, you don't have to understand the details, but there's an effect called the Zeeman effect, which allows us to look at the variation in the spectrum and see and indirectly measure the strength of the magnetic field there. And it's this Zeeman effect measurement that tells us that there must be a strong magnetic uh, source to this uh, sunspot.
so-called. The other thing that gives us some idea that there's a magnetic involvement is you can actually see these magnetic bundles um, trapping charged particles and also producing solar flares and prominences and filaments and uh, other structures at the surface of the Sun. So if you look at the surface of the Sun in the right kind of a filter, you can see the evidence of these magnetic bundles as they pierce the Sun's surface and um, so the, this theory about where sunspots come from and how they work is actually pretty, pretty strong theory. The other thing I want to point out is you can look at the sun during a solar eclipse. We're going to have a solar eclipse actually in, in August. If you want to see totality, you're going to have to drive down to Kentucky, I think. Um, <clears throat> I'll have to get the map out at some point. We can see exactly where you want to go if you want to see the solar eclipse. But... Uh, you can see the chromosphere. Remember, the chromosphere was just outside the photosphere, and um, you can see the colored light around the outside of the moon there during the solar eclipse. That's the chromosphere. And then that extended region that looks more white in color is the corona. If you watch the sun for many years, you'll notice that the output of the sun is not exactly constant, but actually varies in time. And um, these are different kinds of observations. There's sunspots, there's irradiance, there's the number of solar flares, and there's also radio um, energy. But it's clear that the sun has something like a 10 or 11 year cycle over which its output varies periodically. If you look at sunspot recordings, recordings of sunspot number and location on the sun's surface, you'll notice a very interesting pattern that also appears to have a roughly 10-year cycle. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the other thing is, during the course of the cycle, this is the latitude of sunspots and the number of sunspots as a function of time. You'll see that early in the solar cycle, the sunspots tend to have a, a high latitude, 30 degrees north, but later in the solar cycle they get compressed down to the equator more. If you just count the number of sunspots, you can see that the number of sunspots varies periodically. There's sort of an envelope that looks like it fluctuates, but that the periodicity seems to be quite strong. The question is, why does this happen? The strongest model at this moment is something called the Babcock model. And the idea is that the sunspots, as they go around, um, the ones closer to the equator are carried farther in a given period of time than the ones farther from the equator. This is called differential rotation. It's because the material of the sun's surface at the equator actually goes around in a shorter period of time than the material closer to the poles. If you imagine the magnetic field lines in the sun that are being carried along with the uh, particles in the Sun. If there's differential rotation, then you can see that the, if you think of it like a, a limp spaghetti noodle getting wrapped around the Sun, after many rotations it gets wrapped around itself and the, uh, the sunspots correspond to points in where the magnetic field line leaves the Sun and dips back into the Sun. Notice that there in the northern latitude the North Pole of a magnetic field line is in advance of the South Pole. So the magnetic field comes out of the Sun and back into the Sun in these paired sunspots. Sunspots tend to come in pairs. In the South Pole, the order is reversed. And so that uh, leads to this notion that maybe sunspots are simply the uh, departure and re-arrival of magnetic field bundles that are getting wrapped around in tighter and tighter circles. The idea is that maybe um, these bundles get wrapped up and after a while they get so wrapped up that they have to break apart and start over. And that leads to the sun, uh, the sun cycle. So you can read more about the details of that. It turns out actually it wraps up one way and then it starts the other direction and wraps up the other direction and starts back again. So it's actually a 11 year cycle that reverses another 11 year cycle and then it repeats. So it's really more of a 22 year cycle. Anyway, there's more about that in the textbook. 
feel free to dig into it if you're interested, but that's really the main point that we need to get. I'll talk to you guys soon.